Hello, everyone, and welcome to Water Activity 102, Microbial Growth. Today's presentation will be 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A with Mary Galloway, Application Scientist here at Meter Group. If you have a question for Mary, type it into the questions pane at any time during the webinar, and we'll be keeping track of these to answer during the Q&A later. So please don't be shy and submit those questions. We'll also be sending out a link to the on-demand webinar as well as the slides for you to review as soon as they're available. So without further ado, I'll hand the microphone over to Mary Galloway. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking about microbial growth. Uh, today, we're going to cover uh, factors affecting microbial growth, how water activity controls it, government compliance, common food pathogens, how to formulate a specific water activity, and hurdle technology. So uh, first, I want to talk about um, microbial failures. And in regard specifically to product recalls, it can be extremely expensive. Um, <clears throat> There's the recalls uh, can cost millions of do dollars in product losses, uh, operational delays, legal fees, and medical claims. You have to get the food back, you have to dispose of it, you have to take care of the ill, and there's also damage to your reputation. Future sales may suffer from loss of consumer confidence, or they could actually relate uh, that failure to other products that you have, even though they were unrelated, and there is uh, company damage to your reputation. Now I have some pictures down here uh, that show some of the things that actually currently are on a product recall uh, starting this spring. Uh, in January of this year, we have a gold medal on bleached flour was uh, contaminated with salmonella. In April, with organic peanut butter uh, for listeria. But in the past, salmonella has also been a, an issue for that. Uh, in May, raw milk cheese for listeria. Uh, also, uh, Aurora Packing Company in May uh, had an issue with E. coli in their meats. And uh, in July of last year, Kraft Heinz had a cheese dip that had botulism. So there's a lot of things that are touched with uh, adverse microbial growth. So what are the factors that affect uh, microbial growth? Um, we have food acid, time and temperature, oxygen and moisture. And uh, sometimes you might have heard this as fat tom, which is a nice way to remember uh, the different factors that affect microbial growth. So we'll go through these one by one. So first with food, uh, we have nutritional uh, composition that each one of these uh, types of microbes need. So for yeast, they prefer uh, foods that contain simple sugars. That makes sense. That's how we get nice, beautiful bread because of, uh, the yeast eats the sugar in there and, and and does just what we want it to, but it's not always uh, a good thing when we have yeast growing. Um, molds are capable of growth under difficult conditions, and we'll see that um, as they are able to have the lowest water activity limit of other microbes, so they can really um, persevere under difficult situations. Also with acids, the same thing for molds. Um, bacterial pathogens, they prefer uh, protein-based foods. So you'll see that um, in our peanut butter, our milk, and our meat. Those happen a lot, um, all because those will have a lot of proteins in them. Acids, uh, we're talking about pH here. So molds can grow at the lowest pH, so in, in more acidic conditions. Uh, so far as the progression between molds, yeast, bacteria, molds can go the lowest, uh, yeasts are in the middle, and bacteria are the highest. And interestingly, uh, the bacterial pathogens will not grow at a pH below 4.6. And this is going to be a really crucial factor, and we're going to learn more about that as the presentation goes along here. Time. Uh, for microbial growth, it's an exponential growth. Uh, and what that means is that if you have an initial population at time, let's say one, and then by time two, it would be doubled. By time three, it would be four times, et cetera. And it would reach uh, times 4.3 billion by time seven. So uh, it's really key to stop uh, microbial growth in, in, in regards to time uh, very early on before it gets out of control. Now, this growth will continue until it either runs out of food, runs out of oxygen, or there might be like a competing species that's also vying for the same nutrients and other things that that microorganism is looking for. 
Uh, next is temperature. Uh, there are three different uh, temperature ranges for growth. Um, we have the thermal file, which thrives at high temperature. So this would be more like a hot springs, and you can see algae growing in that. We have the mesophile, which is the more moderate temperatures, and that would be more like body temperature, and the most common uh, temperature zone for microbial growth. And we have the psychrophile, which is at low temperatures. Um, so refrigeration. Uh, but Listeria, as an example, can grow in an, uh, anaerobic conditions refrigerated. So that uh, listeria is a real trouble at low temperatures. Um, that's why we have the food safety zone between 4 and 6 C, which is about 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, because that's that, that moderate zone where uh, a lot of microbes grow. Um, but bacteria can be inactivated at elevated uh, time and temperature combinations. So we're talking about retort, which is why we have that. Next is oxygen. So sometimes this is also referred to as redox uh, potential. So we have uh, aerobic, uh, which does require oxygen. We have anaerobic, which does not. We have facultative uh, aerobic, which actually can switch between uh, the, uh, depending between aerobic and anaerobic, depending on the environment. Um, and you can see some examples I've listed for each one of those underneath there. And we have what we call micro aerophiles, uh, which do require oxygen, but in smaller amounts than is actually available in the atmosphere. So those, um, so they wouldn't go in full atmosphere, but in restricted um, oxygen atmospheric conditions, then they would grow. Uh, and lastly, we're going to talk about moisture. Um, we do moisture in amount as the moisture content. We're most specifically interested in the status or energy, which is the same as water activity. If you watched Water Activity 101, then we know that that's where uh, the important part of water is for us in the food system because it tells us what water is able to do. What's it available for? The higher water activity, the more it's able to do if it's moisture migration or in this case, microbial growth. So uh, pathogenic bacteria grow only in water activities above 0.85. Uh, spoilage molds and yeasts uh, grow at water activities above 0.7. And so we've seen that before that um, molds can grow in a little harsher conditions than the pathogenic bacteria. But then there is no microbial growth at all for water activities below uh, 0.60. All right. So how does it actually work? How does uh, water activity control microbial growth? So we're gonna talk about its mode of action, how it actually does that. So here in this slide, I have uh, little beautiful ovals uh, that are going to represent our microorganism. Uh, and in here we have uh, interior to the uh, microbe, a uh, water activity of 0.95. And the environment that that microorganism is in is at 0 0.90. So um, we know from thermodynamics that if we have a difference in water activity, we have a difference in energy level, that it wants to go from high to low to even that out to equilibrate. So the water inside that microbe is going to want to leave, and it does, and it moves out into the environment. Uh, and what happens inside that cell is the, that trigger pressure is lost, and that starts to stress that microorganism out. So in response, the microorganism is going to try to stop that. And what, how it does it is it's going to try to equilibrate its own energies and water activities with the environment. So you can see in the next little pathway there that the micro uh, tries to adapt by altering its membrane to either produce or, um, uh, sorry, to, to reduce its uh, water activity uh, to maintain that trigger pressure. And how it'll do it, it'll either produce or transport in small solutes to reduce the water activity. So this could be amino acids, polyols, sugar, something like that. So it's trying to compensate for the, that loss of, uh, of water out of it. Um, and uh, you can see that it is able to drop it a bit. So it's now at, at 9.3, but it's still not matching the environment of 0.90. So in the next little section here, we see uh, that it's not able to do any more. That's as low as this microorganism can do. So if it's unable to reach that equilibration uh, with water activity to its surroundings, then that micro will remain in what we call a lag phase where there's no growth or it'll begin to sporulate or, and go dormant. 
So it's just in stasis right now. It can't do anything. It can't grow. The, the water is not available for it to, to take in to start reproducing. Um, so it will stay like that until the environment changes. So if it's back in an environment that's 0.93 or above, then it would be able to start growing. But at this point right now, it is in stasis. So in the 1950s, um, uh, w. Scott did some uh, experiments on this all idea of water activity in a different bacterium. So what he did is he took uh, different types of food and inoculated them with different bacteria. And so here's a list of the bacterium that he put in there, specific strains, and then he observed what happened. Did it grow? Did it not? Uh, and you'll see the whole top part of this uh, table here is uh, based on staph aureus. And at various levels, we have inhibition and we uh, also have growth in this toxin that's formed. That's the, the dangerous part of uh, the microorganism and produces that toxin, which is what makes us sick. Um, and uh, I will wanted to point out that uh, pre-cooked bacon towards the middle there, uh, you can see at 0.86 that there is growth for that strain, but at 0.84, there is not. You'll see that it's inhibited. That's a really small difference in water activity, um, but it illustrates, and you can also see as you go uh, up that list, that from uh, anything above uh, 0.85 or above uh, is the difference between growth or inhibition. And for staph, that's true, uh, that if you can lower your water activity to uh, below 0.85, you will not have any staph. As a matter of fact, you'll also find out as we go along here that nothing, no pathogenic bacteria will be able to grow. Staph is the hardest, uh, is the most hardy, it's the most adaptive of, of these uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria. Um, uh, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, oh, yes, I remember, sorry. Uh, what I did also wanna point out is he put this in uh, milk, cream filling, eggs, meat, cheese, beef, bacon, all of these different things are inoculated with the staff, but it didn't matter. The water activity limit uh, stayed the same. So that cutoff is poor bacteria or bacterium, but not uh, food matrix related, which is really important. So you can use this in any of the industries. Uh, here's the list um, where those lie for each one of them. We can see at the top here we have botulism. We have uh, E. coli is listed here. Uh, there's salmonella, uh, listeria, and then at the very, very bottom you can see that staph aureus, uh, the aerobic version of that, is at 0.86. Uh, so n there are no more pathogenic bacteria that will um, grow below that level. So if you have ever seen that about the 0.85 for water activity, that is why, because nothing else can adapt uh, to a water activity lower than that. Staph is the, the hardiest, the most adaptive as the case may be. So this is a table uh, we have for uh, not only those pathogenic bacteria, um, but also molds, molds and spoilage and where no microbial growth is. And so I wanted to kind of point those out. And also uh, you can kind of see where foods uh, that are generally in that similar range to those microorganisms. So we have um, at 0.85 and up, that's where all the potentially hazardous foods lie above that level. Uh, if we go down to um, 0.7, so between 0.85 and 0.7, that's where you'll get some more, um, the yeast and molds will be, and those are our spoilage ones. Uh, but below, um, but there aren't any spoilage uh, molds below 0.7, so you kind of see this funny little uh, section with the os uh, osmophilic yeast right there. But it's, uh, and there are a few molds, but they don't produce spoilage. And then under um, below 0.6, you'll get no microbial growth at all. Nothing will grow below that. So water activity is a critical parameter for compliance and can be used to justify limited microbial uh, testing, which is very important. Um, the FDA has it in their definition of potentially hazardous food. They also have it uh, with FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, both in the HARP-C, which is a risk-based approach, and in HACCP as a cri critical control point. Um, we have uh, 
the CFR 21110 uh, for good manufacturing practices. Uh, USDA also has uh, that as a critical point and good manufacturing pro uh, practices. And pharma, you can also find that in USP 1112 and also the new one that's coming, but it won't be out till next year, uh, 922 as well. And at the last one, uh, if you're familiar with ICH, it's part of the decision tree for assessing hazards. So this is the um, International Conference on Harmonization. Now, these are just a few uh, places where you can find water activity specifically listed as a critical control point or, or it mentions how it can be used to justify the limited microbial testing. But this is not an exhaustive list, so you can still find it more. This is just a taste. All right, so now I'd like to talk about uh, common food pathogens. So we're going to go through them one by one. Uh, and we're going to start by, uh, there's two uh, differentiations between um, uh, the, the pathogens. So we have the foodborne intoxication. So those are caused by actually ingesting a toxin. So the toxin is produced in the food and then you uh, ingest it and then um, you get very sick. And so there's some examples of what would be foodborne intoxication. And then the second type is foodborne uh, infection. And so these are caused by ingesting the pathogenic microorganism, and then it gets in your GI tract, and then it starts to grow. So uh, intoxication is formed in the food, and infection is formed uh, essentially in the gut. That toxin is formed in your gut. So let's start with staph aureus. So um, uh, we have, uh, this one is facultative, and if you remember, that means it can be grow in both situations. It can grow without air, <laughs> without oxygen, or with oxygen. Um, this is a concern for pharmaceutical companies because they have creams and things, and you've got people who are um, uh, immune um, compromised, and so this is, uh, staff is always a concern for them. It can be destroyed by heat treatment and nearly all sanitizing agents, which is very good. Uh, it has the lowest water activity limit, so uh, it's at 0.85, it's the lowest of all the pathogens. Sources, um, you find it on your skin, in sores, hair, your, in your nasal passages, in your nose. Uh, on food, uh, you can have that with uh, hand contact with food, and then that food does not require any additional cooking. So you have a lot of cross-contamination issues with that. Um, salads, filled bakery goods, and sandwiches. So uh, interesting thing is uh, if you find Staph aureus on food processing equipment, it is generally an indication of poor sanitation. So this one can be taken care of quite easily if um, you're careful um, with cleaning and prep and, and try to minimize that uh, cross-contamination issue. Uh, next, we're going to talk about botulism. It's anaerobic. Uh, it will not grow in a pH below 4.6, and it just needs three minutes of boiling to destroy. Uh, its water activity limit is a little higher at 0.94. So where you're going to find botulism is nature, uh, soil, water, plants, and in foods, it's improperly canned foods, uh, especially the low, uh, sorry, low acid foods, so beets, green beans. Um, baked pay, uh, potatoes in, wrapped in foil, smoked fish, you have the herb infused oil where you have the herb that will, can contain uh, the botul botulism on there, and then it's infused in oil, and now you've got a, uh, an anaerobic condition. Uh, and honey uh, can cause children, infants, to have infant botulism, so that's why they have the recommendation to not feed your child honey until they're a year old. Uh, so... A botulism, uh, that it's it's unusual in that it's anaerobic. Most of them are not, but that's where it can be a, a real um, difficulty because once you remove the air and you have a, a, a higher pH, if you don't do the retort, then you can have botulism be an issue. Salmonella. Salmonella is uh, the number one for most reported cases. This is now we're into food infection uh, where you have to ingest it and then it grows in your gut. Um, it's more common in the summer months and that is because it's warmer weather and we have more active animal life. It is also facultative. We've seen that before where it can go either in an oxygen rich or oxygen depleted environment. 
It's also cooked, uh, killed by cooking and pasteurization, and the water activity limit for this one is 0.95. Uh, the sources is contaminated by feces, um, contaminated drinking water, person-to-person -person contact, we see that. Uh, in foods, we have inadequately cooked poultry and poultry products, eggs and egg products, raw fruits, vegetables, uh, unpasteurized milk and milk products like raw milk cheese, which there is a um, recall for that. Uh, as well, uh, flour, which there's um, also for that as well for salmonella right now, and peanut butter, which we've seen in the past. So uh, for flour, um, how that could be contaminated is it actually could be contaminated at the processing facility if it's not kept clean, or there was something else there uh, to infect it with uh, salmonella, or it could be in the field. So you could actually be growing the wheat in um, and if there was, uh, say, the fertilizer was contaminated with salmonella or something like that, then it can even be on the grain before it's even come into process. Uh, for peanut butter, most commonly there's birds around the processing plant that can um, contaminate with salmonella. Uh, generally, that's killed. Salmonella is killed during roasting. But if the exposure happens after the roasting or is again uh, introduced after the roasting, then that uh, salmonella is viable. Um, so for salmonella, the important thing uh, to know is that it won't proliferate uh, at a lower water activity, you know, below 0.85. Matter of fact, we call this peanut butter and flour are part of the uh, low moisture food group. So they generally have a low water activity, quite a bit lower than 0.85. So if they are contaminated with salmonella at that point, they're, they're harmless, they, they can't grow, right? We already talked about that. But the problem is, is you, they're additives to other things. So when you uh, add flour to make a batter or a peanut butter into something, now you've introduced it to a high water activity environment and they will start to grow. And that's where the problems start happening. Um, this is actually a kind of a big concern. You know, how, how do you, um, you know, inoculate for salmonella on flour, you know, without changing the properties of that ingredient, well, flour or peanut butter or something else. Um, so there are studies done. Uh, Dr. Bradley Marks is actually working on getting a database for the Michigan State University on low moisture foods and salmonella, if you were interested in, in uh, looking at that or contributing to that. And there's also some articles. Uh, it's definitely a big concern of how we can um, combat salmonella and E. coli as well, uh, salmonella in particular, uh, to mitigate those uh, problems so we don't find that, you know, uh, when people start using them in their own food products that they, they get contaminated. All right, uh, now listeria. Listeria also facultative. It can grow in refrigerated temperatures, which can be a real problem uh, and unusual for most of our microbes that we're talking about today. It can also be killed by cooking and pasteurization, and it has a water activity limit of 0.92, so a little bit lower, a little more hardy than some of the other ones we've seen. Sources for this are soil, water, and animals carrying that bacterium. And in foods, we see it in uncooked meats like uh, raw hamburger, uh, vegetables, unpasteurized milk and cheese, uh, and cooked or processed foods. Certain soft cheeses, we talked about there was one um, for uh, uh, Heinz for last year, um, processed and ready to meet eats and smoked seafood. And so this has also uh, been a factor for hot dogs. So a similar thing. We've you have um, a low oxygen environment, refrigerate it, listeria can grow if it's present in, in, uh, in that food. Um, the thing about listeria, which is good to point out, that at least 90% of people who get listeria infections are in a high risk group, like pregnant women, older adults, people with weakened immune systems. Healthy children and adults occasionally do get infected with listeria, but they rarely become seriously ill, which is important to point out. Uh, next, we're going to talk about E. coli, also facultative. Um, most strains of E. coli are actually harmless and important in the digestional tract. And um, uh, it uh, actually is used quite a bit in the pharmaceutical industry to make other drugs and things. It's very effective that way. Um, however, this particular strain that we're talking about here is the nasty one that does make people sick. Um, it can be cooked uh, and pasteurized to kill it. Um, and some packagers of like lettuce can use or have used um, a chlorine wash that is partially effective. So it does help, but doesn't always, uh, it's not a 
for sure uh, kill to the E. coli. So it's always important um, to cook your food well, to wash your right, raw ingredients well, to refrigerate and or defrost correctly and watch for cross-contamination. Uh, e. coli is uh, relatively dangerous in that you can have a low infectious dose, um, but it's relatively difficult to kill. So we'll see this in uh, intestines of birds and animals. In food, we have ground beef, raw milk and milk products, raw fruit and vegetables like the greens, like the lettuce. Um, and uh, cross-contamination is a real issue. It's, we've seen that a lot in the news. Um, last year, if you remember, all of the lettuce out of Arizona uh, last April uh, had E. coli, and there was a big, um, we had to throw all of that away, and I'm not sure they even found what was causing that. I was looking recently, and I didn't see if they'd actually identified where it was. Uh, and right now, like I mentioned before, Aurora Packing Company, um, they have a recall for E. coli as well. Bacillus cereus uh, is anaerobic. It multiplies very quickly at room temperature and its incubation time is minutes to hours, but it doesn't last very long. And this is mostly confused with the 24 hour stomach flu. So if you've come down with a bug that only lasts a day, you probably got this guy um, and uh, gave yourself some nice food poisoning. Um, the sources for this is uh, mammals, shellfish, and contaminated water. And foods, it's raw and undercooked poultry, uh, raw milk and milk products. And for starchy foods like rice, sauces, soups, uh, they've been left in the danger zone for two, more than two hours. And now this can grow and give people food poisoning. Uh, the Campylobacter. Uh, is the uh, last one we're going to talk about today. It's microaerophilic, so that's one where it has to have a low uh, oxygen, less than atmospheric. Uh, it also can be killed by cooking and pasteurization. Uh, it is the number one cause of bacterial uh, diarrhea. So this is also known as traveler's diarrhea, so if you ever get this when you've been traveling abroad, uh, this is probably what you've been infected with. Uh, the problem with uh, it as well is that um, it can cause more bigger issues in the future like IBS, GBS, or arthritis. But the thing is, is it's generally isolated um, to a person or a group, uh, so it's not extremely widespread. Uh, its water activity limit is extremely high at 0.99, the highest out of all of them. Uh, you're going to find this in the gut of mammals, shellfish, and contaminated water. And in foods, we have raw undercooked poultry and raw milk and milk products. All right, so if we know uh, that uh, water activity, if we can reduce that, that will change what microbes we're going to grow. How do you actually do that? How can you formulate for water activity? First, you can dehydrate the product. That is the ancient way of uh, preserving food, is just to dry it out. You lower the water activity, microbes can't grow, and it stays for a long time. Uh, you can have edible films or coatings, and that would be to prevent or limit the moisture migration. So moisture migration is um, caused by differences in water activity. So if you can kind of limit that, uh, the, that shift in moisture change from one component to the next, then you can kind of uh, limit where that can grow. <clears throat> You can introduce caking, anti-caking agents. And what these do, they absorb uh, excess moisture. So you'll see that in like table salt will have it. Uh, there's a little powder in there that they put in that will absorb the moisture. It's not part of the salt in salt crystal, but it is added with it uh, and that absorbs the moisture before the salt can absorb the moisture. Uh, and actually one of the most useful ways to lower water activity is adding a humectant. And these can be added um, singularly or in groups or so they can have additive properties. So salt is a very effective um, humectant and humectant means that it's going to uh, lower the water activity, also uh, tends to <clears throat> increase the moisture content that a, a product can hold because we're, we're binding the water um, so that it can't be used anywhere else. We're physically, you know, chemically binding it, uh, lowers the water activity, but it also increases the overall moisture in your product. Um, then we have sugars. Sugars are also very effective at that. Uh, glycols, um, like propylene glycol and things like that, um, are good humectant. Uh, amino acids, polymers. Polymers are interesting. They're not quite as effective. These last ones here are not quite as effective as like sugars and salts and things and, and some of the glycols um, because starches are really long. 
And so what happens is they um, they have water binding sites on them, but because they're so long, they kind of wrap around each other and hide those binding sites. So uh, even though they have the capability, they just don't have them available. So they're not as effective as some of the things, but they do have some good humectant properties. And then lastly, we have acids. Um, there are some limits uh, to using humectants to lower your water activity. I've kind of gone over a few of them as we <clears throat> talked about the list prior. Uh, solubility. There is a solubility limit as an example for like salt, uh, which is 0.75. So you could add salt to your um, whatever, your product, but it won't lo lower it bo below 0.75 because the, that salt is actually going to start to crystallize out. Um, uh, also, molecular weight, like I was talking about before with the starch, it's just really long chains and so they kind of wrap along themselves and so they kind of have a limited amount that they can actually bond with. Uh, organoleptic, um, like as an example, if you were to use salt to its maximum effect, uh, you probably wouldn't want to because it would make your product so salty no one could, could eat it. Um, crystallization in storage. That could be salt, again, about what I talked about, same idea. but um, Sugar has the same issue as well. If you uh, try to use it below um, 0.845, I'm trying to remember exactly, um, it will start to, it can crystallize out as well unless you um, <clears throat> have something else in there with it. You can increase your reactivity, have a browning reagent, like if you have a, what we call a reducing sugar in there and you've used it a lot, it can actually cause a browning reaction. And toxicity, if you use um, propylene glycol, that also that does a, a good job of lowering water activity and incre increasing your moisture in your product, but there is a limit. One, one if you use quite a bit, it, it also has the organoleptic property of being kind of bitter, but it actually can get to a toxic level uh, if you use too much. Um, so those some considerations when you're uh, using humectants as additives, but what you can do to kind of mitigate some of those things is uh, do combinations. So you could add, you know, some of one, some of another, a little more sugar, a little more salt, maybe a little preservative or, or you know, a, a glycerin or something like that. All right, last thing I want to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, hurdle technology. All right, hurdle technology combines preservation techniques to establish a series of preservative factors or hurdles that the microorganism in question are unable to overcome or jump over. So some of these uh, hurdles might be um, temperature, like refrigeration, reducing the water activity, the acid, increasing the acid, uh, reducing the oxygen, adding a preservative or other things. And the thing about this is that these factors can be combined to have their effects, uh, have, excuse me, their effects be additive. So they can be added together and that will make the environment where uh, the microbes won't be able to grow. So this is pretty powerful stuff because you can combine things to reduce its ability, that microbe's ability to overcome those hurdles. So here is a kind of a demonstration <clears throat> of the hurdle effect and then kind of what each of these hurdles are. If you look at one, two, and five, you'll see that um, this particular microbe is able to overcome everything. And the last thing they have to do is they have to add a preservative. And that's what it's going to take to stop that microbial growth. If you look at example three, we have a temperature there, um, but uh, it's actually controlled by water activity. So in this sense, we could just drop the water activity. That would be enough to stop microbial growth and we're done. Um, in four, the preservative is not enough. And so it's able to clear all of the hurdles that we put on there. And maybe we're limited by um, the, the product that we want or the flavor or you know some kind of property that won't allow us to change anything else. And so it just needs to be refrigerated. So, you know, as an example of like a packaged meat or cheese or you know something like that, we have to kind of maintain the integrity of the product. So in this sense, we just need to refrigerate it. Um, uh, a six as a, a last one here, we can see that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, uh, the temperature. I uh, was able to clear the water activity just barely, but then pH uh, was able to control the microbial growth for this example, number six. So I wanna talk about that a little bit more about this interaction between water activity and uh, pH. So this is a table from uh, the uh, US food code. And what it shows is the interaction between pH and water activity to control the spores on food. And in particular, these are heat-treated uh, foods that are packaged 
afterwards. And so you'll notice that we have across the top the pH values and across uh, going down the left are the water activity values. And so in, in, uh, inside the table we have non-PHF which means uh, not a potentially hazardous food or it doesn't need to be time temperature controlled for food safety. And you'll notice that when we have a higher uh, pH then our water activity uh, has to be lower. So if you look here, it says greater than 5.6 pH, the water activity is that it needs to be below 0.92. Now, as you move to the left on pH, which means you're decreasing the pH, you notice that uh, our allowable water activity limit is actually going up. So we're able to raise that to 0.95. This next example is similar to the first one, except for this time, uh, the food is not heat treated or it's heat treated but not packaged. So a little a lighter conditions uh, in the treatment of the food. So you can see the same setup here. We have pH across the top and then the water activity values are on the left. And we'll see here that at greater than 0.56, you have to have a water activity below 0.88. Right, but as we drop our pH, our water activity was able to increase. If you go all the way over, if we're able to drop it um, below 4.2, we can have a water activity of up to 0.92. So this is really powerful stuff because if you have a sauce, um, especially let's say um, a ketchup or uh, something like that, if you had, uh, if you could drop the pH, and generally those types of sauces do with the vinegar in them, then you actually can have a higher water activity allow, allowed for that product uh, because the acid is increased. All right, so in conclusion, um, we have the factors that affect microbial growth, which is food, acid time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture, or you can refer to that as fat tom, which I think is funny, um, but effective. Uh, we have uh, that a microbial uh, growth can be controlled by water activity regardless of food matrix, and you can't say that by some of the other things. If you think about food that you eat, uh, meat, uh, if you're going to cook a turkey or um, beef steak or uh, pork, uh, especially the poultry and pork, uh, there is a minimum uh, time and temperature, but they're different between each one of them. So it does matter which food matrix uh, that is in to control the microbial growth, but that is not the case with water activity. It's also a critical control parameter for government compliance and can be used to justify limited microbial testing. Uh, and uh, that's really huge too, because um, since it doesn't matter uh, if you're able to um, keep your water activity below 8.5, it doesn't matter what microbes, you just know that, that you know that they're not going to grow. And, and so it's very difficult to try to test for every, every kind of microbe uh, possible in your food. As you can see from what we were talking about before about the, the specifics, different, uh, the different um, common food pathogens, there's a lot of industries that overlap for different, uh, different microbes. Uh, and the interaction between uh, water activity and pH is the only combination that is specifically outlined in the FDA food code. So I think that is it for me. So let's see, do we have any questions? All right, thanks, Mary. Um, you know what, it's, that, that was a ton of great information. <laughs> Thank you very much, we appreciate that. Um, it does look like we're a little short on time. Um, so I think what we're gonna do because we have a lot of great questions out there and we want to be able to get to them um, and give them their due time. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect all the questions and if you have any questions right now, please uh, put them, type them into the questions pane. We're gonna collect all the questions that have come through and I think we're gonna, we're gonna write up a, a written up Q and A that okay. we'll be able to send out, <laughs> we'll be able to email out to everybody who has attended uh, today's uh, webinar here. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're just gonna, advance to this next references slide because uh, there have been a lot of people that have been interested in some of the, the information you've been giving out. Um, so again, thank you um, all you attendees uh, today for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this discussion um, as much as we did. And again, we'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days with links to this recording as well as the slides from this presentation. Uh, so stay tuned for future Meter Food webinars and have a great day. Thank you.